Hello, I'm Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My guest today is Peter Mark Jacobson, writer, director, and executive producer. Peter is best known as the showrunner of the popular 90s sitcom The Nanny, which he created and produced with his then-wife, Fran Drescher, who also starred in the series. TV Land aired a series he co-created with Fran, happily divorced, based on their 18-year marriage, which ended after Peter told Fran he is gay. Peter served as executive producer and writer. Don't go away. I'll be right back with Peter Mark Jacobson. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> you know, um, we all have our journeys and, you know, you starting out in the entertainment world. I know you grew up in New York. Um, was there a sense of you knew that this was your destiny or or was there a, an epiphany that happened as a young man growing up i think when when i was a really young man many years ago um my parents used to bring me to uh, broadway twice a year we would see a broadway show and i was so caught up in that world of a make-believe and the lights and the scenery and I just was fascinated by it and television. I was fascinated by sitcoms and I would watch them and pretend I had my own sitcom. And uh, uh, so I feel like in a way uh, I manifested my future, not knowing what I was doing. I didn't try to do that, but I, I, I pretended. So it was so real in my head and then it happened. Yeah, you know, I think as young children, and I've, many of the people I've interviewed over the years, I have said the same thing. You know, they they were, uh, in in a sense, they they were setting the intention of what they wanted to create. Some were aware of it consciously and unconsciously. So as you saw the theater, which was a wonderful place to grow up. What was what was the next step? I know you I know you met Fran in in high school or you were high school sweethearts. Was she destined for also acting? Was she doing that or was it just You know, back in the day um uh, in New York, uh we went to a progressive high school. It was the first of its kind where half the day you did uh academics and then the rest of the day you specialized in pre-med, theater, whatever it was. And we chose the theater career path and we met doing um, a show and immediately became best friends. We both had the same sense of humor. We both uh, got very involved in theater at school. Um, we would teach um, senior cit cit citizens uh, after school theater. Um, uh, and as we got a little, as we, when we graduated, uh, my mother who sold Avon used to sell to a woman who managed young kids who wanted to be actors uh, and do TV commercials. So we met with her, it was cousins management and um, uh, they signed us and we started to work professionally in the business at 17 years old, I think it was, uh, doing TV commercials. I love it. What was your first commercial? My first commercial was Lifesavers. <laughs> I love it. The flavor goes on and on. <laughs> you know, you never really forget. Years ago, when I was an actor, I did Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I can't eat that chicken because we had to eat it so much. But I think your, yeah. first, your first exposure as a teenager you know, you're in the lights, the cameras, it's all real. So what after you uh, you became had a taste of the commercials, what happened next? You, you well, we did we would go out after, uh, you know, um, we would go every day to Manhattan and to Tad's Steakhouse for a three dollar steak. And um, and then we would go audition and we started working a fair amount getting pretty successful doing tv commercials was fran and fran Fra doing fran was doing commercials too yes we both did them uh she her first one was mcdonald's and she said um 
you know, welcome to McDonald's holding a tray. And when we saw it, they took her voice out. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, why? <laughs> and uh, um, uh, then she, we, she started to audition for some movies in New York. And she got Saturday Night Fever, um, oh. which started her career. And then got Paramount became aware of her and flew her out to um, California to audition for a movie called American Hot Wax. I was still doing commercials back in New York, but was going to join her. And uh, I was doing a a commercial with Steven Weber, who later on in life played her husband in her last sitcom. Uh And um, uh, we were teenagers doing a wise potato chip commercial. And I flew back to to um, California to be with Fran, who was doing this movie. And, you know, we were living at Oakwood Garden Apartments. And I grew, I didn't grow up. My family didn't have any money. So when I saw Oakwood Garden Apartments, it had a pool. Yeah, we're right down give, the street from there. <laughs> yeah, and they used to give away free bagels on Saturday. And I felt like I was living, you know, the high life. <laughs> and a jacuzzi, you know, I had never experienced anything like that and um uh i was you know we were very happy we we were working and um you know not working and uh, working and i started to audition for uh commercials and then out in los angeles and then i'd start doing episodic tv um like in 90210 and um murphy brown and uh i was pilots and the two of us were working and Fran would usually do a pilot every year, and they didn't get picked up, most of them. And she did one last pilot, and she said, you know what? If I can't get in on the bottom floor producing, producing side of it, right. I don't want to do this anymore because I just see the mistakes that they're making. And um, at least if I'm making the mistake, I could say, all right, well, I did it. But, you know, I, I just I – just, I think I can do this better. So um, she had done a last pilot and she had a meeting and she had done a pilot, a bunch of, a picked up series for six called princesses at uh, CBS. And the review said, when will CBS learn? It should be called princess. And uh, she ran into Jeff Sagansky on a plane who is the head of CBS Mm -hmm. and basically cornered him. And said, would you just let me come in with my ideas? And he finally, because, you know, where was he going to go? Coach, uh, he said, yes, come in. Just let me sleep. And <laughs> she came in. Uh, we, we came in and, and she went away, we went to, I think she was going to London to be with Twiggy. And she um, was taking care of Twiggy's kid. And she thought it was such a funny relationship this new york girl with this proper english kid and she called me up and she said what do you think about the sound of music except i come to the door and i had just sold a show for for uh, dan Aykroyd, uh with dan Aykroyd, i should say i'm sorry uh, he actually sold it but i came up with the idea and um uh i said to fran yeah that that idea that you just pitched uh, uh julie andrews coming to the door that's the way to go that that's the show we got to go sell. And, um, we went in and sold it and, uh, they bought six of them. Excellent. And the rest was kind of, you history. know, and I think Peter, that's the way of the future for any performer is to have hands on. I recently was at the producers guild breakfast and I, I chatted with Margot Robbie and she was talking about how, um, six studios turned down Barbie took her six years to make it. Same with Maestro with Bradley Cooper. And he had won an Academy Award and they said, no, 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 we don't want it. So I think the intention that the individual has in any performer is really just the belief. uh, And you, you believed in this project and it was a big hit. I mean, I remember the nanny was, was all over the place. Yeah, it was huge. Um, It was um, crazy. Yeah. And so during that time, did you sense that there was issues with you and Fran or was it just you said, well, I have this 
side of myself that I haven't revealed. No, no, no. We, we were um, um, victims of a violent crime years before the nanny. Mm. And I had told Fran that, you know, um, I, I was in really bad shape and she was, you know, and I was like, um, I started thinking, because I had always in my mind um, was attracted to men and women. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what to make it. You know, I, I, back in my day, there was no such thing as gay. You, Correct. In Flushing, Queens, we didn't, nobody talked about it. Uh, so I didn't know what to make it, but I felt horribly guilty if I even thought about it. And I kind of, I remember magically thinking, saying to a therapist, maybe I brought on this, brought on this um, horrible incident because of, you know, I'm not telling the truth about who I am. And uh, I told Fran, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm bisexual, I think, and uh, I don't want to act on it or anything, but I do have these feelings. And she at the time didn't want to be alone. That was her thing. She, she, and so we continued to live together and work together and have an, our relationship together. But I was always very, I couldn't get it out of my head and thinking, am I cheating her of her life? Am I cheating me out of my life? And basically about to have a nervous breakdown when we sold the nanny. And then it was sort of like, pull yourself together. You're n- never going to get a chance like this again uh, and go to work, which I did right before getting having the nervous breakdown. And uh, But we never dealt with anything, really. And um, I became very controlling uh, so as not to deal with my own problems. I controlled her, telling her what to eat, what to drink, who to talk to, where, you know, terrible. And she finally said, you know what? I've had it. I, I don't want to live like this. And uh, we split up and um, separated, but still worked together. And it was very hard. And uh, I had no family at that point. So it was kind of like an orphan. Um, and uh, the show ended three years later. And we weren't getting back together or anything. So I moved to New York to try to figure out who I was and uh, started my journey. And that's how it happened. You know, I think also, Peter, when people have, I call it breakthroughs, not breakdowns, um, that each individual experience in life brings us to a certain consciousness and, you know, when we, uh, let's say, step into the growth factor of it, we can then look at ourselves and say, okay, I need to be authentic, but I need to also be grounded. Um, as you as you went back to New York, uh, did you throw yourself into something to grow? Did you get into music? I mean, what was the healing factor for you that put you into the new space headspace well i wish it was this uh, beautiful as that <laughs> but i threw myself into going out every night to gay clubs and uh trying to figure out who i was and i was very paranoid because at the time we were on you know a lot of a lot of tabloid covers and things like that getting divorced because the show was so big and i didn't want people to know i was there and um uh so i'd wear a cap and glasses and you know not that anybody really would have cared anyway, but at the time I didn't, I didn't want to hurt Fran or anybody. I just wanted to figure out who I was. And um, so uh, I just kind of had my gay adolescence uh, at, you know, 40 and um, uh, trying to figure out where do I fit in in all this. And um, eventually, you know, calmed down and, um, came back to Los Angeles to do um, what I like about you with Amanda Bynes and Karen, Rich, uh, Karen uh, Lucas. And um, Fran and I built a friendship again when she, her manager called me, who was my manager and said that she had cancer and we hadn't spoken for a year and immediately all the anger left and just the love was there. And I called my manager and said, listen, if she wants me to come take care of her, um, or what, or not talk to me, or whatever, just let her know I'm 
sending best to her and am there for her. And she wrote, sent a note back, said she would like to speak to me, but after surgery. And um, we built a friendship after that and uh, eventually developed um, a happily divorced because of that. And, you know, Peter, I think the thing is that if you look at all of the, the, let's say, the lifespan, really at the end of this life, love is really all there is. And so how, how do you think one individual or individuals can learn to love themselves? Because we all come into this life with lessons. Everybody's at a different, you know, school of life. Um, what would you, what would you suggest to somebody who's completely lost and really doesn't know themselves? What would be a, a, a tip that you could say, here's what, what you should probably do or what I did? Well, don't base yourself or anything on other people or their relationships, thinking it's life has got to be a certain way. You know, I kind of grew up that way, watching television with Ozzy and Harriet and these perfect families. And, you know, when you look at their real lives of these people, they were far from perfect. And nobody has a perfect life. Nobody, you know, sexuality, there's a whole realm of people that are 100% gay, 100% straight, and then there's a whole bunch of people that are in the middle somewhere. And find what makes you authentically happy, whatever it is, because that's your truth. Yep. And learn to find comfort in that. It may not be what other people want. It may not be what your parents want or anyone, but that's how God or the universe or who, whatever you want to call it created you. And that's what makes you different than anybody else. And that's when your success will probably happen. You know, Fran is very, very comfortable in her own body. She, she is who she is. She didn't try to change her voice and uh, as, the, as the world told her to do. You'll never work, they said, with that voice. I thought that's what made her interesting, that she was so beautiful and had that funny voice. I said, that's what makes you special, I think. Yeah. And I was right. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think, you know, everybody has a gift. And so many people um, uh, in the industry, they try to say, no, you'll never work. You, you, you know, you're, you, you know, I mean, exactly what happened to Jennifer Hudson. Everybody told her she was never going to make it. And, yeah. uh, she she's you know four time winner of everything you know she's got anybody who tells you you're not gonna stop listening immediately nobody knows nothing just live your life live your truth do what you love and it will happen something will happen out of that if you do what you love something will happen don't listen to people who are going to naysay or say you're doing it the wrong way. You can learn from people and people who are will can teach you some great stuff. But uh, as soon as someone says you that's not going to you can't do that, I would stop listening to that person. What does the soul mean to you? I think it's your truth. I think it's your inner truth. What's not not covered by social things or what we've learned or, you know, just what's so raw and truthful. And uh, every time you can bring yourself back to that, I find it for myself the most powerful. Whenever I try to make things happen, um, I don't know. It doesn't seem to work for me. When I let go and just let what's happening come to me, that's when I've been the most successful. Yeah, you have to trust and believe. And whatever faith you work with, I think that's part of the mission is to activate that within yourself. Um, what is your ultimate mission in this life, Peter? I like to make people laugh. 
um, it's so rewarding uh, when I write something uh, or people come up to me on the street and say, oh, I love the nanny. Um, uh, when I'm down or when I was sick, I would watch it every day and it would make me feel good. Uh, making people laugh is such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful emotion. I mean, they've proven it helps cure you. Um, I think that was why that was my mission to make people laugh and feel good and um, entertain them. I think that's why I was put here. Um, uh, if you were um, granted one wish for humanity, what would that be? Health. Just that everything else you can you can change, but health sometimes and health you can too, but. If you don't have health, you have nothing. I agree. And I know it's, 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 you know, it's said and people roll their eye and, oh, yeah, we know that, we know that. But you don't know that. You really don't. Because I, if, in, until you get unhealthy and you realize how nothing else matters, that fancy house in the hills is borrowed. We're all here borrowing stuff. None of it is ours. Can't take any of it with you. It's nice that we can borrow it. It's nice to borrow a pretty house. It's nice to have a pretty car. But at the end of the day, that's going to be here and you're not. Exactly. Exactly. So be kind to people. Help people if you can. Yeah. If someone's, you know, I find myself with road rage sometimes, and then I have to say to myself, you know what, if they want to get in front of me, let them go. Just go. Have a good day. I don't know what they're going through. Sometimes, I, you know, I'm not that perfect, and I don't. But as much as I possibly can, I try to try to be kind to people. And, uh, you know, if I could change something, I'd stay off the internet more because it's so mean spirited and I think unhealthy. And if you could just, if you read, there is nothing somebody can do that somebody isn't going to say something negative about it. And when you realize that this is just people's opinions, it's, you know, exactly. garbage, really. Um, do you have do Peter um, a, a, a ritual? I know you. I know I see you at my gym and you work out. But what do you do? Do you meditate? Do you do any positive thinking, affirmations? What's What's the ritual to keep yourself in balance? I write a gratitude list every day mm -hmm. um, of everything I'm grateful for, and um, uh, when I'm riding the car, I'll make lists again in my head of everything I'm grateful for. Uh, the other day I was getting in, I was in traffic and I was getting really nervous and I thought I had just got some bad news about someone who was very, very sick. And I thought to myself, God, this person would love to be sitting here in traffic with the radio on warm in the rain. And they're dealing with another reality right now. So, you know, that's again back to health. Uh, I do do that. I do meditate. Um, uh, I I I only do it for like ten minutes at a time, mm -hmm. um, but it's enough. I, I take these what they call power naps, ten twenty minutes in the day, mm -hmm. um, where I'll put on a meditation power nap. You can just find them on your computer for free. Um, I I um, I eat uh, pristinely. I try to you know watch watch what I eat, um, so it's healthy, organic foods, and I work out every day for about an hour. Um, and, um, and I try to be of service to people if I can. Excellent. Um, quick, quick one word answers. Um, what does love mean to you? Smiles. What does God mean to you? Peace. What is your favorite thing to do on a Sunday morning to
to just be Peter? Uh, feel the sun on my face. Excellent. Great, Peter. Well, you know, thank you so much for this time together. And um, I wish you great success in everything you do. You're, you're already in alignment to your, your energy. But um, people can follow you uh, on your Instagram. Um, and uh, that is uh, at official Peter Mark Jacobson. And um, you've been an inspiration. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. I, very kind of you to say. So thank you for spending this time with me. And I'm Gary Quinn. Join me for another episode of Ready, Set, Live. Be well. <laughs>